Kevin, thank you so much for leaving, brother. That's been so great. Can we just give the Lord another round of applause and say thank you to our choir for leading us today? I just want to let you know, um, man, it's such a great day to be here in the Lord's house this morning. As we were singing that song, I love the words, hear the joyful sound of your people sing. I just want you to know, man, it has been just a joy to, to just worship with you today. Uh, just a few moments ago, when y'all clapped at the end of that song, man, I just felt like there was such unity in here. And, and just to be a part of that, it's been special. I know the Lord has just got to be smiling in heaven as we as his children just offer up praises and songs of joy and celebration to him this morning. What a blessing it is. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to turn me to the Old Testament. I want us to turn to the book of Psalms, and I want us to study Psalm 91 this morning. And so, uh, as you're turning there to Psalm 91, can we bow our heads and let's pray together? Uh, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have today, not only to, to see a young man get baptized and to celebrate with him about his choice to follow you and to turn to you, but Father God, we have a chance to sing songs of praise to you with, with thanksgiving, Lord God, to let our voices ring out that God, you save, you are worthy of our praise. And God, that's been great to do this morning. Father God, I pray that every one of us um, will, will just turn to you today and trust in you today and believe in you today and that God, you would not leave us the way we were when we came in here, but God, you would transform us today. And so Father, please, do a work in every one of our hearts and lives, God. I pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, turn to Psalm 91. We're going to study that this morning. As we're turning there, let's just have some fun. I want you guys to participate with me for a second. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about um, the safest place on earth. Uh, anybody have any idea what the safest place on earth might be? <laughs> what? Switzerland. All three services, very first answer has been Switzerland, okay? Um, believe it or not, a study came out. Switzerland was not the safest place uh, or country, I should say, on earth. Anybody know what the safest pla uh, country on earth is? Um, actually, China in one study was, the, was, was uh, reported to be the safest country. According to statistics, they say Iceland for four years running has been the safest country on earth. I'm like, are you kidding me? Their police don't even carry weapons. Uh, they, I think, well, I take that back. I think they carry sticks and they carry, uh, what is that, spray stuff? Pepper spray, that's it. They carry pepper spray, yeah. Just, if you're gonna be a, be a bad person, just wear goggles in Iceland and you'll be fine. Just kidding, just kidding. I, I'm not condoning badness. Um, um, <laughs> I just found that interesting. Portugal was like number third. I was like, that was pretty cool. Portugal's number three on that list. That was pretty neat. What about, um, what about military sites? What's the safest military base? Anybody know what the government ranks as the safest military location is? What? You, you know, somebody else said that. I, I feel safe here. I think Kings Bay is marvelous. No, Kings Bay didn't make the top 10, believe it or not. <laughs> what? Louisiana. All right. That wasn't on the list either. Um, <laughs> what? Area 51. No, definitely Area 51 wasn't on the list. They actually said Quantico um, was the safest place, ranked number one. I was like, wow, that's fascinating. I thought that was amazing. What about bank vaults? What's the safest bank vault, do you think? What? <laughs> Where? <laughs> what? What's... I Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what that is. I was like, phew, right over my head. Backboard, maybe it'll go in. Um, I, I was thinking maybe Fort Knox. I don't know. Um, I was thinking, what about on top of a mountain? Would, would being on top of a mountain maybe be the safest place? You know, you could look down. You can see things coming. You could kind of be up by yourself. What about an uninhabited island? Like if you were the only one on the island, you only had to deal with yourself, could that be safe? <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I would not be good. <laughs> well, today I want you to see that according to Psalm 91, the safest place is in a shadow. The safest place is in a shadow. Let's read together. Psalm 91, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. 
His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you and no plague will come near your tent. Let me just, uh, as we begin to look at this passage today, let me just share with you that I believe the safest place on earth is to be in the shadow. According to this passage, it says the shadow of the Almighty. Today, as we look at this passage, you're going to see in Psalm 91, I believe, a simple outline for this text. It's got three basic points. Point number one, let me give it to you now, is the teaching. That's verse one. Verse one is the teaching. If I was outlining this, point number two would be the believer's response to the teaching. When you understand verse one, then verses two through verse eight is how we should respond as believers to the teaching of verse one. And then verses nine through 16, if you're outlining it, number three would be the divine response to trusting. How does God respond when a person trusts in him? Well, let's just jump into this passage. Let's look at verse one. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty. As we begin to look at this passage, that is the key teaching. That teaching is essential to understanding everything else in verses two through 16. If you want to know why verses two through 16 are so important, then you have to know what is being taught in verse one. And verse one essentially is teaching this, that The person that trusts God to hide and protect them will experience his presence and protection. All right, that's it. In a nutshell, that's the main idea of the teaching. The person that trusts God to hide and protect them will experience his presence and protection. If if I had to say it simply, it would be just this. The person that turns to God for safety will find it. The person that turns to God for safety will find it. We'll find it. That's, that's the teaching. Now, let me just break that down to you. Let's study the words in verse one. It says he, third person singular. This is a general statement to any person. So every person in my hearing right now, this applies to you as an individual, man or woman, boy or girl, student or adult. This morning, if you will look at this teaching and if you will uh, believe in it and, and accept it and do it, then this, this teaching is for you. You can receive this today. So he or she, the person who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, the word translated dwell there is a word that means to sit and stay. So any person that chooses to sit and stay in the shelter, the sh- word translated shelter there means secret hiding place. I love this word because it's, it's kind of a military word. It's the picture of a military sniper who is kind of put themselves in a concealed secret location and they're covered up, they're unable to be seen and they're just there, sitting there, hiding quietly, concealed. It is a secret, all right, hiding place. I love that. Here it says though, but specifically that secret hiding place is the most high God. You're hiding yourself in him. So watch this. The person who sits and stays in the secret hiding place that is the most high God, the person that does that will, watch this, abide. The word translated abide here means to lodge or to stay, to stay the night at someone's house. Whereas in the first verse it says he who dwells, the word dwell there is focused on what you're doing. You're not moving, you are actively staying in one place. You are choosing not to move, you are choosing to sit and remain. This word isn't focused on what you're doing, this word is focused on where you are at. This word focuses on your location. That person who chooses to sit and stay in the secret place, which is the Most High God, will be located in the shadow. The word shadow means shade or protection. That person will be located in the protection of the Almighty. That's the teaching. 
See, you and I have the opportunity today to choose to sit and stay in the secret place which is God himself. And when we do that, we will, watch this, become located in the very house and location and protection of God himself. That's the teaching. Now, if we do that, if we turn to God and we seek God's protection and safety, as believers then, what does that look like? Well, here's our response to the teaching, verse two. Now look at the change. Verse one said he, third person singular, all of us included, all of us possible. In verse two, it says I, I will say. Okay, that I will say is a choice. And so what we, he, what we see here as the believer's response to the teaching is that a person receives this promise of safety by choosing Jehovah as his refuge, fortress, and God. I will say, I will choose. Here's the teaching. Anyone can do this. But as for me, I choose to say to the Lord, you are my refuge, you are my fortress, you are my God in whom I trust. The word translated my refuge here is a word that means shelter, to shelter from a storm or to shelter from a danger. It, it means turning to God and letting God be the place that when the storm comes or the danger arises, you go to God, you run to God. God is your secret hiding place. Have you ever had a difficulty come up and you wonder what you should do? Have you ever run to your bedroom and just knelt down in prayer and hid there? There are times in our lives that we need to understand that the best thing that we can do is run to God and let God be our refuge. But not only that, in this passage, it says we should say when we turn to God, not only is God our refuge, but he is our fortress. The word translated fortress here is a more active word, a more aggressive word. It means shelter from an aggressor. The first word, a refuge, is kind of a passive word where, where you're just sitting and you're just staying there and, and, and things uh, buffet against you. They're not necessarily attacking you directly, but they're just around you and you're protected from them. However, this word means you're being sheltered from an aggressor. Somebody is looking for you and only you and specifically you. And that aggressor wants to destroy you and hurt you and come after you. And this word says that God then becomes for you the walls and the location where you go and he is actively keeping out the aggressor that's coming at you. Man, what a great word. And when we turn to God, that's what we're saying. God, when people come against me, may you stand between me and them. God, you be the fortress in which I trust. You be the walls that, that protect me when the aggressors come against me. And then finally, he says in this passage, my God in whom I trust. The word translated my God there is the word Elohim. It's a very specific name for God and we're gonna study that in a second because you see in this passage in verses one and two, there are four names for God, four different names for God in those first two verses. The first name for God is in verse one. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high. The word translated most high is Elyon. In fact, in the Hebrew language, El Elyon is the, the name for the God Most High. And El Elyon refers to and focuses on the position of God, the position that he is above everything and above everyone. El Elyon is saying God is number one in position. There is no other God up there where he's at. He is in number one rank. He is all by himself. There is no one else on that shelf. It's him and only him. Everyone and everything else is underneath him because he is, listen to me, El Yon, the most high God. Positionally, there is no one like him. Everything else is underneath him. He is sovereign. But not only that, in verse one, it says that he is the almighty God. This is the word Shaddai. You guys remember that old song? El Shaddai, want me to sing it for you? I ain't singing today. Thank you for saying yes, I appreciate that. <clears throat> it's the word Shaddai, right? Shaddai means powerful. One who acts strongly or one who acts with strength. And, and God is the powerful God. In fact, this word actually refers to, at times, to how we should respond as men. As men, we should respond with Shaddai. We should respond with strength. 
Do you realize that's a, a part of a man's character? You should, be, uh, you should respond with strength. But here, it's talking about God's strength and God's power. And just as he is the most high God, it says that he is the most powerful God. He is all powerful. He is number one in position and he is number one in power. And when God is put on the number one position and the number one power, listen to me, that's the one we should turn to. Okay, we should turn to the God where there is no other God with the power that he has. There is no other God. There is no other being. There is no other person that can do what our God does. He is all powerful. And we should turn to him. And then in verse 2 it says, I will say to the Lord. The Lord is the word Jehovah. Jehovah is one of the most important names to the Hebrew people because the term Jehovah, the name Jehovah, which is so special to them, it's special because Jehovah is the God that promises them. And he is the God that promises to us. Jehovah, as the God who makes promises, is the one who says something and then does it for us. He is the God that chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God that chose and spoke to David. He is the God that throughout all of the generations of people, it is this God, Jehovah, that makes promises to us as human beings and then keeps them. So the focus of that name is God who promises. And then finally, it finishes in verse 2 with, My God in whom I trust, Elohim. Elohim refers to the creator God. This is the first name in the Bible for God. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim. The God of plurality and unity. The God of creation. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Trinity. All three persons beautifully united in one. The very person and character of God. All that God is. That, that amazing triune God. Listen, that is the God that we look to and we say, that's my God. The creator God. His person, plurality and unity. The God of creation. The God of Genesis. The God of the beginning and the end. That is who we turn to. And so when we really look at, at our response to trusting God, if you really sincerely are trusting in God, then you've got to turn to this God, the God that's number one in position, the God that's number one in power, the God that makes promises, and the God who, listen to me, is personal to you and me, who reveals himself to you and me, the God that we can know through his son Jesus. That's the God that we turn to and find protection and find in him a hiding place in his shadow. And so a person receives the promise of safety by choosing this God to be our refuge, fortress, and God. And then we see that a person experiences this promise as God rescues, comforts, and protects them. Look at verse three. It says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Go ahead and circle the word for and then underline the phrase, he will deliver you. You see, there's, there's the first part. He will deliver you in verse 3. Then in verse 4, he will cover you. And then you actually have to underline the end of verse 4. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. He is a shield to you. Those three essences understand this experience that when we turn to God, we experience this promise of safety as rescue, comfort, and protection. The word in verse 3 that we circled there, the word for, this is a result clause or a purpose clause. It means because. Okay, so what it's saying is this. Because you have chosen in verse 2 to make God your refuge, your fortress, and the God in whom you trust, because you have done that, watch this, because that, he will deliver you. He will deliver you. This is a result clause. And so a person's choice of God results in their rescue. And when we understand that rescue, it means he will deliver you. He will snatch you away. The word deliver here means to snatch away, to save, or to rescue. Like, have you ever watched those videos of dad babysitting their kids? Right? Have you seen those? And like, it looks like the dad's on their phone and their kid's playing, like, you know, on the couch next to them. And, and all of a sudden, like, you see that kid and they're like, oh, they're about to go right off the couch head first. And as that kid starts to go, what happens to the dad? He just snatches them up and saves them, right? Or like maybe they're out by the pool and all of a sudden you see that kid walking right for the, the pool and you think, oh, that kid's going in the water. And all of a sudden dad comes over and snatches them away from the, the, the scary part of the pool, right? 
The dad snatches away and rescues them. That's the picture. There are moments in our lives where where we are kind of teetering on danger and we are teetering on about being in a position of, 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 of terrible situation and God snatches us away to safety. That's the picture. He will deliver you. He will snatch you away and rescue you from the trouble you're about to be in. And I want you to know that God sovereignly keeps a trusting person out in this passage out of the snare of the fowler. And really the, the proper way in the original language is out of the snare of the snarer. I, I understand it from the language like this, out of the trapper's trap. And that's how God rescues us. He keeps us out of those moments where, where Satan is trying to trap us and Satan is trying to get us and, and this world is trying to tear us away from him. God sovereignly keeps that trusting person out of the trapper's traps. But not only this, in this passage it says he will rescue you and deliver you from the deadly pestilence. So God sovereignly keeps a trusting person out of the deadly pestilence. That word pestilence is the word plagues. And, and I see in this passage an illustration and a remembrance back to Egypt. Back to Egypt. What's interesting is this. Turn me to Psalm 90. Psalm 91, there's no prefix, prefix or prescript to it. it does, we don't know who wrote Psalm 91. We don't know. Okay. However, in Psalm 90, we see a prescript that says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. So in Psalm 90, Psalm 90 is a psalm that Moses wrote. The, the man who delivered the people and led the people out of Egypt and led them to the promised land. Like this, this is Moses, the man of God. Look at the first line of Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Wow. So Psalm 90 begins where Psalm 91 lives. Psalm 91 is all about us understanding that God is our dwelling place. Psalm 91 is about us choosing to let God and, and to choose to want God to be the dwelling place of our lives. And, and Psalm 90 is telling us this, that God has always been that. There's never been a time where humanity can't find safety. Humanity throughout all of time and through every generation has had a safety spot. And humanity, through all of its generations, has been able to turn to God and find in God the safest place on earth. God, throughout all of our generations, has been our dwelling place, has been the place where a human being can go and find rescue and find safety. And I believe that here in Psalm 91, that's this reference. This reference is going back to Moses, the man of God, remembering how God led them out of Egypt and remembering and illustrating to the people saying, listen, remember how when we came out, God had sent 10 deadly plagues. In every one of those plagues, they never affected you as Hebrew people. God separated the Hebrews from the Egyptians. And when those plagues were done, the Hebrew people were prepared were protected and rescued from every one of those plagues. But in contrast, the, the Egyptian people experienced that and it was this terrible moment and the Egyptians realized there is only one all-powerful God and it wasn't theirs. And those plagues, although they came, never touched the people of God. You see, God sovereignly keeps a trusting person out of the deadly pestilence and then he says in verse four, he says, and he will, underline that phrase, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. The word translated cover here means truly to cover over or to fence in or to hedge in. It's an incredible picture. And what we see is that God covers over a person that trusts in him and God fences out the dangers from a person that trusts in him. Okay, there's a poem that says, good fences make good neighbors. Have you heard of it? Yeah, good fences, right? Don't make good neighbors. Good fences keep dangers out. How many of you, right, if your wife said, honey, I think we should build a fence around our house. How many of you, men, went to your wife and said, here's what I'm going to do, honey, since you want a fence. I'm going to fence the sides of our house, but I'm not going to do the front or the back. Your wife would look at you like, honey, you crazy. 
So you say, all right, well, I'll tell you what, then I'll do the front and I'll do the back, but I'm not going to do the sides. You don't have to look at honey. That's not any better. If we're going to fence the yard, she's going to tell you to fence how much of the yard? The whole yard. Fence all of the yard. Why? Because when you build a fence, you want to keep all of the dangers out from any direction they might come. That's the point. When God covers us, he keeps all of the dangers out. And he uses a quite beautiful illustration. He uses a bird illustration. Now, I got to tell you, a few weeks ago, I was, um, I was stepping out of my house into the garage. And at our house, when you go out from the house into the garage, our door opens to the left. And so I was um, going out of the house into the garage for something. And so I swing the door open as I took one step out. All right. Door still open. Something jumps out like, and it jumps right in front of me about belt high and then stayed belt high and then, and I just froze. I was like, what just happened? I had no idea. And then after the shock and the fear wore off, I was like, okay, I think that was a bird. So I gently closed the door and I just kind of stood there and I was kind of like looking around like, okay, where did it come from? And is there another one? And then I noticed there was a ball of pine needles that had formed in this thing right here to the left of the door. And so I kind of bent over, and in that ball of pine needles, there was just a little hole. And I could see through the little hole into the pine needles, and I saw an egg. It was a bird egg. That was a bird that <laughs> scared me crazy. I didn't even see the thing. No, that's kind of not, that's not a good thing, right? Because like that bird, big scary guy walks out the door. He's like, out of here, see ya, pew, pew, egg, you're on your own. But as I was studying this message, it kind of, I, I thought to that bird that kind of flew out. Pew, pew. I was like, do all birds just kind of fly away when a big bad guy comes? Or, or do birds actually do what's said here? Do birds actually kind of cover their nest and spread their wings over? And I found birds do spread their wings over their nest. In fact, I came across a video that showed a bird doing that very thing. In this video, it really is quite amazing. This baby bird was hatched, featherless, kind of ugly and gross looking like an alien. And it's just, it's just looking up, opening its mouth, crying and, and making noise, saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. And the mama bird comes with food. And as that little bird says, beep, 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 it, it dropped that food in that little baby bird's mouth and it just swallowed it down. And right after it swallowed that food down, it's like, I was like, okay, now I can go to sleep. And it laid right down to go to sleep. And then that mama bird did the most amazing thing. It must have been the last meal of the day. Baby bird lays down to go to bed. That mama bird started kind of spreading out its feathered and, and kind of like you see this thing swell up with feathers. I'm like, what's happening? And it's just swelling up its feathers and it kind of covered up that baby bird in the nest. And then it spread out, it, out its wings in this beautiful little dome right over that baby bird and right over that nest. It's incredible. All you saw was the little bird's head on top, wings fanned out like a dome over the nest, and the baby bird, you couldn't see it anymore. Totally covered in the nest with the mama bird feathering it on top. It's incredible. As the video kind of then fast forwards through the next few hours, you see a storm roll in. The mama bird hasn't moved at all. Bush starts to shake, tree starts to shake, nest is shaking, mama bird motionless. Starts to rain, raindrops are falling on the mama bird, rolling off the bird's uh, feathers off the, off the nest, and, and the, the baby bird underneath, you can tell, unconcerned about the rain or the wind. And the mama bird just right there. And you know what I noticed? That whole time, that little baby bird was comfortable underneath that mama bird's feathers. The mama bird never went to sleep. The mama bird was awake and alert, protecting that baby that it had spread its wings out over. That mama bird never once stopped being on alert, protecting its baby. That's a beautiful picture. You see, God never goes to sleep when he's protecting us. When we put ourselves into his protection, he covers us and he never stops being alert for us. John Phillips tells the story uh, about a forest fire that swept through Africa and there was a missionary and that missionary 
had to get out of the way and had to go to safety because that fire was literally burning everything, the brush and the trees and everything in its path. And so he left and found safety. And then the fire finally came through and, and he comes back. And after he comes back, after the fire had swept through, he's walking through all of the burnt bushes and the, um, and the debris and the destruction. He noticed a, a nest. And he noticed the charred remains of a mama hen charred on top of the nest. And so idly, he kind of just kind of touched it with his foot and kicked it with his foot. And then when the moment he did that to the astonishment and his surprise, all of a sudden when he touched that nest, out came running baby chicks from underneath that mama hen, alive and perfectly fine. See, under her wings, they were protected and comforted during that fire that encompassed them. God puts us underneath his protection, and underneath that protection, there is no fire that can get to us. We are safe under his protection. He then says in this passage in verse 4, his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You need to underline the the phrase shield and buckler there. You see, he will shield you. He will protect you. The word translated shield here is a word referring to a large shield used to protect the whole person. It's it's a body shield. It's a a big oversized piece uh, of shielding where any person can stand behind it and nothing can get through the shield. All of you, all of who you are is protected behind that shield. But not only that, it says, but his faithfulness is a buckler. That is referring to a bulwark or really a, a smaller shield that is able to be wielded all around a person. It's, it's, it's smaller, it's nimble. You can move it anywhere around a person. So whatever direction the threat might come from, that smaller shield is able to be quickly wielded and bring protection to a person. The focus is on the ability to cover in all directions. So watch this. God as our protector is able to protect all of us from any direction of danger or threat, and he can take care of us. And when he does that, and when we trust in him, the Bible says you will not fear. You see, the protection of God should remove fear from us. We should not fear the great features that we may face. Whether it's a terror by night, whether it's an arrow by day, whether it's pestilence or destruction, it doesn't matter what great feature, what we may face, we do not fear. And then he says, the very next line, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 by your right hand, but it will not come near you. In other words, we do not fear the great features of what we face, nor do we fear the great fails or falls, how much we may face. It doesn't matter whether it's a thousand, it doesn't matter whether it's 10,000, it doesn't matter whether it's a hundred thousand or a million. Listen, we have turned to God, we have trusted in him, he is our protection, and we do not fear no matter how much we face. Because he is our God, and we have turned to him, and we trust in him. And then in verse 9, we see the beauty of this, and this is God's response, the divine response to the person that trusts. Look at verse 9. It says, because, or for, circle that word. Once again, that is a, a purpose or a result clause. And what it's telling us is that because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, because you have called him your refuge, your fortress, your God in whom you trust, okay? Because you have done that, he says there's a promise, verse 10. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. Since you have trusted in me, he says, I will not let evil befall you, nor a plague come near you. The word evil refers to God protecting you from uh, the wickedness around you. Plague is God's promise to protect the trusting person from the plagues, namely strokes, plagues, or the leprosies, or the the pictures of God's judgment or wrath that could befall a person uh, who's living wickedly. And then look at what he says here, and this this is beautiful in verses 11 through 13. Why? Why is it that we, we are able to be protected? How is it that we are able to be protected from the evils and the plagues that are around us? Verse 11, for, because. 
because God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. How is it that you and I can be protected from this? Watch this, because God will give his angels charge concerning you. God will protect us by commanding his angels regarding us. He will command them to speak to us. He will command them to be with us, and he will command them to fight for us. What a joy. Have you ever heard of this concept of of guardian angels? Okay, the reality of it is, is that God, when somebody puts their faith and trust in him and they turn to him and they say, you are my God, you are my refuge, you are my fortress, you are the God in whom I trust, God then responds and says, fine, I'm going to send my angels to help you. They're going to talk to you, they're going to guide you, they're going to supernaturally protect you when necessary. And that's the blessing that we have when we turn to God and trust in him. And then look at the promise restated in verses 14 through 16. He says, because, because this person has turned to me, because this person, watch this, holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him. I love that. Once again, he, he's showing the, the result clause, the purpose clause. Because you have chosen me, God says, because you have held fast to me in love, since you have loved me, right, he says, I will deliver you and set you on high. The word love here means to cling to. So because you have chosen to cling to me, to grab onto me, and to never let go of me, he says, I will be with you. I will deliver you. I will cause you to escape these dangers. I will set you on high. The word set on high there means to set above everything, to place uh, inaccessibly high. I know exactly what that means. My wife, Christy, she collects white dishes. And she has some of her favorite white platters. And you know where she puts those white platters? She puts them on the top shelf. Now, her really favorite ones, she leaves out for you to see, but not touch. They're on the top shelves where they can be seen and appreciated and valued, but not touched. I was in the... Uh, pantry the other day and she had put one of her white uh, platters all the way on the top shelf all the way in the corner next to the wall as if to say honey don't touch it don't mess with it don't drop it don't break it okay the only way to get to that was for me to bring a ladder into the pantry and get it it was inaccessibly high God does that see God loves you and I so much my wife loves those platters And she values those platters, and so she keeps them safe and protected by putting them up high, inaccessibly high, where no one can get to them and accidentally pull them down and break them. She doesn't put them down low where kids can get them down. She she doesn't put them at middle levels where uh, teenagers can get to them and mess with them. No, she puts them inaccessibly high where they can be valued and kept safe. And God does that for us. Because he loves us so much and values us so much, he sets us on high. And then he says, and I love this in verse 15. He says, since he calls to me, I will answer him, I will be with him, I will rescue him, I will satisfy him, and I will show him my salvation. I love that. Since you have loved me and clinged to me, And he says, since you have called upon me. The word call upon me there means to respond to God, to talk to God, to pay attention to God. And he says, since you turned to me and paid attention to me, since you turned to me and called to me and talked with me, since you responded to me when I showed myself to you, look at all of these I wills, underline all of these. I will answer, I will be with, I will rescue, honor him. It says, I will honor him. I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. Well, I mean, what better God is there than that? The God that is with us, the God that rescues us, the God that honors us, the God that satisfies us, the God that shows us his salvation. This is amazing. And what's beautiful is that very last statement when he says, and show him my salvation. The word salvation there is the word Yeshua. It's the word that we translate in the New Testament as Jesus, God's salvation. God says, when you turn to me, I will show you Yeshua, 
I will show you that Jesus is God's salvation. It's incredible. So churches, I think about the takeaways that we should take from this. Number one is this. A key attribute to a trusting relationship is sitting and staying. A real relationship of trust isn't one where you are in and you're out. Relationships where you see one person in and then out and then they want back in and then they get out and then they're in it and out of it, that's not a trusting relationship. If you say, I love Jesus, but like you're with Jesus and then you're not with Jesus and you're with Jesus and not with Jesus, listen, that's not a trusting relationship. You see, a real relationship of trust is one of constant nearness and togetherness. When you, when you choose to enter into that relationship, you trust that other person to protect you like you do God. And, and watch this, you sit and you stay. You sit and you stay with God. The second takeaway is this, I, a key attribute to a trusting relationship is knowing the person's character. For you to have a true trusting relationship, you need to know who it is you're, you're interacting with. And so knowing who God is and what he promises is essential to trusting him. If you don't know that he is the, uh, the, the almighty God, if you don't know if he is the most uh, significant God in position, if you don't know that he's the all-powerful God, if you don't know if he's the God that makes promises to you, if you don't know that he's the God that you can personally know, if you don't know that, then how are you going to ever trust him? But when you do know that he's positionally above everything, when you do know that there's no God that has the power that he has, when you do know that he makes promises to you and he keeps those promises, when you do know that this God wants you to have a relationship with him, then listen to me, that's the God you should turn to and you can trust him. And finally, the third takeaway is simply this. The value of trusting Christ is found in the help that God offers in response to you turning to him. You really want to know why and what the value is of trusting Christ? The value is found, is found in the help that God gives you when you turn to him. See, according to this passage, he himself rescues you. He himself commands his angels regarding you. And he himself shows you his salvation. I mean, look at how valuable that is. And so if God offers you that, why would you not turn to him today?